In this video, we're going to take a look at this machine, which is my IBM PC XT from 1986. This was sort of the first, wasn't sort of the first vintage machine I really used or owned, but it was the first vintage machine that I sort of bought myself and restored and got all working. So when I got this machine, I found it on eBay, and it was listed as original XP machine, which isn't the quite correct term for it. So not many people bid on it, so I got it quite cheap. But in typical sort of eBay fashion, it was listed as not tested, which basically means it's broken. And it looked like completely grubby in the photo, it was sort of sitting on top of a pile of other like AV equipment just dumped there and it looked quite in sort of quite sad condition. But what I did see is an IBM Model M keyboard sitting on top of it. So I emailed the seller and said, oh, does, is the keyboard included? And they went, yeah, the keyboard comes with it. So effectively I bid for the keyboard and treated the machine coming as a bonus and thought, well, if the machine works, awesome. If I can fix the machine, that's also good. But if not, I'll still get the keyboard out of it. So yeah, the machine turned up. Um, Keyboard worked absolutely fine, apart from the slight issue where a few of the keycaps had fallen off in a box full of packing peanuts, which resulted in many hours of sifting through them trying to find them. But the keyboard all worked fine. Thought, let's see if the machine works. Plugged it in, switched it on, nothing. It was just sort of, it turned on, nothing happened at all. So I thought, well that's pain. Took it apart to see if there was anything obvious. And I found when you switched it on, there was a slight click from inside the power supply and the fan twitched. And I thought, that's a bit interesting. So I did just the usual diagnostics. Unplugged the motherboard, left the drives plugged in, switched the power supply on, fired up absolutely fine. Unplugged the drives, plugged it into the motherboard, switched the machine on, no, no, no power again. So anytime the power supply was connected to the motherboard, it was shut off. So I thought, that's like some sort of protection being sort of kicking in. So I took a multimeter out and probed around the motherboard and found that there was a short directly between the negative 12 volt rail and the ground connector and thought, hmm, that's interesting. So I effectively disconnected negative 12 volt at that point because it's not used for anything on the motherboard, it's only used for some ISA cards and it fired straight up, so I thought well that's interesting so I dug around the motherboard more and found a single capacitor that had failed it was a tantalum capacitor and those things can short circuit when they fail and that was just shutting the power supply out and causing it to cut, cut off so took that capacitor out, wasn't even necessary and the machine works absolutely fine ever since so yeah, we, we'll take a look inside and we'll see the actual capacitor removed and everything but yeah, got this machine completely restored. So we can now fire it up and see it running. So if we turn it on... I'm pretty sure the light's dimmed there when I turned that on. <laughs> Must be the extension leader plugged into. But we can see here, it's now booting up. So it's doing a RAM count as you can see here. This machine has a full memory, it has 640 kilobytes. Which doesn't really sound like much, but that is the maximum these would take without sort of extending memory drivers and stuff. And we'll see this when we get inside, it's a bunch of just individual RAM chips on the motherboard. So this is a later Model XT because it actually has a 640K on board, it doesn't require additional card for 640K. Is it beeping? Can you hear the hard drive now make a noise? And we can see we are now at the DOS prompt. So a little bit about the specs of this machine. This is a later model, so it has all 640K on board rather than requiring expansion cards. It has a 4.77 MHz Intel 8088 processor. So, very early <laughs> Intel chip, as we can, as you can probably tell. It also has a 20 MB hard drive. That has been replaced. It originally came with a full height 10 MB drive. Um, that was dead. It, well, it worked, it spun up and everything, but it had bad sectors on like sector zero, so you couldn't format it essentially. So it spins up and everything, but it's effectively dead, it's not really usable. So the drive I've put in instead is a Seagate ST225, which we'll see when we get inside, is a half height five and a quarter inch drive. I don't feel too bad about putting that in because even though it's not the original same exact same model that came with it, XTs of this generation were completely available with those drives, so it's not like it's a completely not period correct drive, it is a drive these could have come with, just not the one this exact machine originally shipped with. But yeah, we can see it's all running here. This is the monitor, it's running on the original IBM 5151 monitor, which is an MDA monitor, so completely monochrome, no real graphics capability, and as you can see it is green on black, which is looks pretty cool to look at. So what we'll do is we'll take a look at the machine running some stuff, and we'll just take a quick look at it running, and then as always, we'll, just, we'll take a look at it running, shut it down, and then we'll tear it apart and see what's inside. So here's a closer up view of that old 5 and a quarter inch hard drive. I'm going to listen to it running because it actually makes quite a sort of nice, interesting, distinctive noise.
So we're now taking a closer up look at the machine running. So as you can see here we're at the DOS prompt, and if you look at the DOS version, you can see we're running MS-DOS version 5. Now this isn't strictly appropriate for this machine, it, it really should be running IBM PC-DOS in probably like version 3 or something, quite an old version. However, obviously because the hardware was failed in this machine when I got it, I couldn't use the original software install and had to reinstall it myself. And I just happened to already have a full box set of MS-DOS 5 floppies which I could use. If I wanted to use PC-DOS, I'd either have to go and buy a set or try and download them and write them to floppy. And obviously at, this, at that point in time, this machine was the only one I had with a 5 quarter inch floppy drive. So trying to write those discs would have been a bit of a pain, if not impossible. So MS-DOS 5 works, and realistically it's not a massive difference. So, yep, it's running MS-DOS 5. So we take a look at what's on the hard drive. You can see what we have here. There's not a huge amount installed, but there's some software on here. We'll just quickly go through and see what there is. So that's a sort of bare DOS install. We've got a few games on here. Well, one game. And that is Zork. So... Zork is an old text-based adventure game. That's because this machine can't do any sort of graphics, even slightly. Um, it can, the most it can do is like ASCII art type stuff. So games are generally sort of text-based. But Zork is pretty cool. Is it? Yeah, there we go. Oh. That's it, loading up Zork. Now this game has proven quite popular. Um, one thing I tend to do with this machine is at university we ran sort of games events, they still sort of run them and I still sort of go along sometimes, where they basically fill a room with as many games and consoles as they can. And one thing that I tend to do is take, a few, take along a few old machines. So quite often I'll take along Zork and hook it all up and people can play it. And I've seen quite a few arguments break out over people playing Zork. No go east, no go west and stuff like that. So it definitely becomes fairly popular, even with people nowadays. So this is Zork running here. So it sort of gives you a scenario that you're sort of, you know, where you are or what you're seeing. And you can tell things like open mailbox, and then you can also do things like if you get sort of good at it, you can like chain commands. So take leaflet, read leaflet. There you go, and then you go north, north of the house, go east, open, open window, open window. and you do all this sort of stuff. So it's actually quite a fun game to play, and you can sort of. You get quite into it, like I've seen people literally sit and play this for, you know, two hours at a time just constantly working it out and like drawing maps on paper of like where they are in the game trying to work out things. And it's a really pretty fun game, so yeah, that's one sort of game you can play on this. It's the only game I've really run on this, but yeah, it's actually pretty fun. So we quit that, and we'll take a look at what else we have. So I've got multiple different versions of Zork. They're all very much the same thing. They've just got different sort of scenes and stuff in them. That's the only real game that's on here. But we do have other stuff. So, for example, if you look in programs, oh, we have Laplink. Oh, no, I can't actually demonstrate this because I've not got the appropriate cable handy. But we can probably open it. So Laplink is software designed for transferring files over serial between two machines. And this has proven extremely useful for getting software onto this machine because you can connect this up to a, a more modern laptop running like an early version of Windows usually like DOS and you can transfer files across. So I've actually had to do that with some machines. For example, you can see here, there's a folder called Compaq. That's actually the, the setup disk for my Compaq Portable 2 I did, I did a video of before. And I had to make a setup disk using an image I found on the internet. So what I had to do was download that image onto a more modern PC, copy it to a 3.5 inch floppy disk, put it into an old DOS laptop, and then connect that laptop into this over serial and use Laplink to transfer the file across. I was then able to use this machine to write the floppy disk. So yeah, Laplink has proven to be extremely useful on this machine. Unfortunately I can't really demonstrate it, but it does have it. Uh, can you do that on DOS? Oh, you can do that on DOS, nice. Um, the only other real program I have on here is Lotus123. So this program is quite cool because obviously it's a spreadsheet program but it's Lotus123 that really brought the IBM PC into the mainstream and it's sort of what we really have to thank for having PCs today as they are because Lotus123 was such a hit in the business environment all businesses tended to go for IBM PCs over all the other hardware that was out there. So really it was Lotus123 that sort of kick-started the IBM PC and made it popular. So we can take a look at it, so if we start it going It is we well to load. Hmm. 
And this is Lotus123 running. Um, so you can see it's a very old spreadsheet program. You know, you put you know, numbers in there and see if you remember how to do this. I've forgotten how to do sum. Is it at sum a, a1 dot dot b1? Is that it? Sort of, when you've done a, made a circular thing, haven't I? Um, that's some A1 colon A2. That's what I tried to do. Oh, not colon, that's Excel. There we go. And that's a spreadsheet, which is incredibly dull. It's not really the sort of thing that you go, oh wow, that's such a cool machine, you know, it's not like a game or anything. But this is really what made the IBM PC so popular, was programs like Lotus 1, 2, 3. And it's got sort of very early sort of menu system on here. F1 will also open help where you can get information on all the commands. It has full graphing capabilities and everything, so it's actually like pretty powerful software. So that's really all I've got installed into the show. Nothing hugely exciting there. Down the line, if anyone has any suggestions of games or whatever I could run on this that would work with the MDA video card rather than any sort of graphics card that we'd require, give me a shout and I can possibly do videos of them. But the one program we're going to use now, before we switch it off and take it apart, is called Speed Store. Speed Store is software that you use to park the hard drive for transit, which is required in a situation like this because I'm about to take the machine apart. These old machines have stepper motor based hard drives, and if you don't park them, when you move the machine you can damage the drive, because what you have to do is you have to use a program to park the drive and that moves the head to a certain position on the disc where it doesn't matter if they touch the platter. So now let's use Speed Store to park the drive. So CD, SSTOR. And on the program, which is SSTOR. So Speed Store does loads of other stuff. You can see it's giving information about the machine here. Um, you can also see it lets you set the drive up, do tests, do low-level formatting, and all that stuff. But all we want to do is go to Park Heads. If you press Enter here, you'll hear a very slight little noise from the hard drive, and then it'll be ready to park to move. So if you hear a little beep noise there as the drive moves its heads. But the machine is now ready to be switched off, as it says, and it says turn system power off. So now we're just going to turn the machine off, and you'll see the other really cool thing with this monitor is how, or is how it switches off. It's just so, it just looks so old. There you go. That's it off, and you can see the monitor goes like an old TV, and the whole picture sort of shoots to the middle. So the first bit of hardware we're going to look at here is the keyboard. People who like their keyboards are probably instantly recognising this as an IBM Model M, and it is. This is actually one of the earliest Model M's made. Originally, the IBM PC and the XT shipped with the Model F keyboard, which was a slightly different layout, well, quite a different layout. It had the function keys down the left and smaller keys, and it was a completely sort of different style. And internally, it used a slightly different sort of switch mechanism. However, later Model XTs, so from the late sort of 86 onwards, shipped with Model M's like this. You can tell that this keyboard was designed for an XT and nothing newer like an 80 or later on a PS2, because it's got this sort of blank space here where you would normally have LEDs. That's because the XT's keyboard protocol doesn't support the use of LEDs. The original Model F never had any, and they never added the support into the PC for use with Model M's. So it's just got this sort of blank space, because Model M's would have been being sold with the AT as a newer machine. So they did actually have LEDs in some models, but the ones shipped with the XT just sort of had like a little blank space here. So that's how you can tell it's designed for an XT. And yeah, it's a typical Model M really. You can see it's got the removable keycaps because it's an early model, so these do easily pop off resulting in just a little keycap there, and then a little sort of space underneath that these clip back onto. So these are really easy to get off and clean. And I have taken all the keycaps off and cleaned them when I got the machine, so they're really good condition. Um, the rest of the keyboard is a bit yellowed, I need to try and work out something to do with that. I'm probably going to look into RetroBright or something down the line to sort that. But yeah, and you can see some of these are you know dual colour keys, you can see Sys Request on there is actually in green, along with the Alt key is also in green which basically says that you press ALT to use this request. is how they do it, they sort of colour code it like that. And yeah, so it's actually in really good condition. You can also see up here, we have the silver label, which is the sort of logo that was used on the oldest Model M's. After this, they introduced the grey label on the left-hand side, and then on the more modern ones, they introduced the blue label. But that is the sort of original Model M label. And yes, it weighs an absolute tonne. So over here we can see the interface, which is a big 5-pin DIN plug. That's, that's the sort of connector used on the XT, and I think the AT as well used the same one. And as you can see here, it is IBM branded, which is quite nice. 
However, we don't need to worry too much about the connector being different to a modern PC, like not having a PS2 plug, because like all the early model M's, it has our detachable cable. So you can just pull that out there, and that gives you this old sort of amp connector. I'm not sure what that's actually called, but it's made by amp. But yeah, it gives you that old connector. And I was able to put a cable from a more modern model M in with a PS2 connector, and it worked absolutely fine on a modern PC. We can also see in the bottom there is the label, which unfortunately is completely worn out, so it's really hard to make out. I have spent a while looking at it under like a brighter light, and I figured out that you can see there's the details there. So the model is a 1389969, and it was made in 1986. And I can't remember what that number is. It's a part number, serial number, something like that. But yeah, that is the old label. Don't know how it's coming out on camera, it's very faded. But you can all see it's made in the UK, so these were all made in Scotland, along with the machine. There's the old speaker hole, which still doesn't actually have a speaker in it, so I don't think that was, was that ever used. I think it was maybe using the terminal ones. But yeah, that is the old original Model M keyboard. And this is really what I bid for when I bought the machine. I thought, well, I'll bid for the keyboard, and if the machine works, it's a bonus. And I got a working keyboard, and ultimately, after fixing it, a working machine. The next piece of hardware we're going to look at is the monitor. This is the IBM Model 5151, which is the monitor used from the early, the original PC all the way up until, until like, sort of the AT days. This is a monochrome MDA monitor, so it's green on black as you saw earlier. And here's the interface connectors here, so you can see this is just a regular male IAC connector to go into the back of the PC. And this D-sub connector is the MDA video interface that connects to the PC. On the front of the monitor we can see we have the CRT, which is about 11 and a half inches. And over here we can see the IBM logo, where it says IBM Personal Computer Display. Down here we can see we have two knobs, one to adjust the contrast, one to adjust the brightness. On the top of the monitor we can just see there's just a few air vents and over here we can see the IBM logo again with the full model number of 5151. Down here there's a bit of information about it, made in Taiwan, manufactured for IBM and this is obviously locked 220 to 240 volts because it's a UK model and then down here we can see where the cables are just sort of permanently attached into the bottom of the machine. There is a sort of access panel you can roughly remove so I think you could potentially get these out if you needed to but they are effectively permanently wired. On the bottom of the monitor we can see we have a serial number and manufacturing date of August 1986. So that puts this monitor to being very close to the same age as the PC, which is quite cool. On the side of the monitor, we can see an original PAT testing sticker dated 1995. So that means this monitor was in use up until the mid-90s. This monitor was bought separately from the machine, so that doesn't really relate to the machine itself, but yep, we can see when the monitor was being used until. So one thing that you really notice with this monitor is that there's no flicker to it like you tend to get with CRTs. It's just such a clear, sort of clear crisp image with absolutely no flicker. Now that's because the green phosphors they use in this screen take so long to fade out, there's, no, there's so much persistence to them. So, you know, there's no time for the phosphor to fade out before it's re-energised by the electron gun. So you can really see this, if we open Lotus 1, 2, 3 on this, just notice how long it takes for things to fade out. So Lotus is now loading. Takes a little while, obviously. Now you can see the like the actual command prompt, the DOS prompt, is taking a while to fade out and now that's loaded, look how long it's taking the splash screen to fade out like, still visible <laughs> it like, it's still there and it'll stay there for you know a good while until it's completely disappeared and now if you notice if I move the cursor and look how long it takes the cursor to fade out now that's not some sort of illusion with the camera that is what I'm actually seeing on the screen, if not even more noticeable on the screen like on the screen I can still see that splash screen just about so yeah, that's the sort of sheer persistence you have on this. And if we quit the program, that's a quit, but that is Lotus still fading out in the background. This is the one risk with these monitors though, is that they're very susceptible to screen burn-in. This one has a tiny bit, if you open a completely green screen, you can almost see slight bits of text. I think there's a bit of text saying like main menu at the very top. Um, you've got to be really careful with these for screen burn, because just because of that persistence, they burn really easily. But now the cool thing is when you turn it off, if we turn it off in a completely dark room, watch what happens. It does that flash that switches off, and you can just see the sort of remains of where the electron gun fired before it switches the screen off. It's pretty cool. And it's probably not showing up much on camera now, but I've done this before and switched it off in a darkened room, and it stayed like vaguely visibly glowing for like minutes. Like, you probably can't see it on camera, but I can still clearly see that glowing. I can even, I can even see the outline of Lotus 1, 2, 3 still. So yeah, it's definitely a pretty cool monitor. So here we are looking at the front of the machine. 
But you can see it's got quite a cool sort of distinctive look to it. It's a lot sort of there's it's sort of sloped at the front, so it's like it's a lot thicker here than it is at the top, and this all slopes up. And it's got this sort of white plastic on the front, and then the rest of it's all grey metal. Over here on the left of the machine, we can see we have the IBM logo along with the, te the text saying Personal Computer XT. And here's some sort of vents. There's no real active cooling in this, so I don't know if they're really for airflow. Um, the PC speaker is also behind here, so I wonder if that's more for the speaker, or if maybe just to allow some like rough air to get through it, because the power supply does contain a fan, I suppose. So yeah, sort of vents there. Over here we can now see the floppy drive. This has a single half-height floppy drive, five and a quarter inch. This is a later thing on the XTs. The early XTs had full-height floppy drive, so you could only really have one floppy drive if you had a hard drive. Whereas the later model XTs like this had took the half-height drive, so you could install a second, hard, a second floppy drive down here if you wanted. And finally over here we can see that five and a quarter inch hard drive with the LED here and the IBM branding up here, which is quite nice. On the left-hand side of the machine there's not really anything. However, on the right-hand side you'll find the power switch, which is located towards the back. And this has to be one of the most sort of satisfying power switches I've ever had in a PC. It is a very satisfying clunk. And here's just a close-up of that power switch. It's definitely a pretty satisfying switch to use. So now here we are looking at the rear of the machine. Now as you can see, most of the I.O. is done through expansion cards. The only real onboard connector is the keyboard port. So now let's go along the back and we'll see what there is. So over here on the left-hand side, we can see we have the IBM logo with a 5160 model below it. And here's an original Computer Center maintenance badge. This is like a sort of asset tag. Computer Center are a company that sort of, they do like manage computing, computer services, like they'll maintain all the computers in a large company. So that's obviously come from a company that's had a contract with them and that's the maintenance sort of asset tag. Down here we can see the original IBM sticker, where it's, yeah, like many of the other IBM machines I have, it's made in Greenock in Scotland, which is 70 or so miles away, it's not too far. Again, model 5160, with more information about it. Here we can see we have the connections on the power supply, so we have standard IEC power in, and then the output to the monitor. And then here is a, just a sort of air vent for the fan on the power supply, just a sort of exhaust. Over here we can see the rest of the I.O. So we have the keyboard connector here, which is quite recessed deep into the machine because it's directly on the motherboard. Here's a little panel you can remove. I'm not sure what that's for. Um, I'm wondering if it's for some sort of like RTC, like you had a real-time clock installed. Like you could put the battery behind here so you could service it easily. But I can't really easily find much information about this. But yeah, it's just a little panel that comes off and just is a di direct hole through to the inside. Now if we take a look at the cards we have. We have this, which is the serial port card. So that's just 25 pin serial. This card, this is empty. This is a floppy drive controller card. Um, and it's got a big external connector on it. So I think that's probably for an external floppy drive or something. This card here is a hard drive controller, so there's no rear I.O. on it. They're all blank. And then here we can see we have the printer port and the MDA monitor port. So the printer and monitor provided by a single card. So the back of the machine is just held on with a bunch of screws around the outside. So we just take these all out. Annoyingly they're all flathead, which makes them a complete pain to remove. But yep, take these screws out and we'll get inside. So now I've removed those screws, I absolutely hate the flathead screws they use, they're a complete pain to get out. We can now take the top off so it just slides forward and we'll see inside. So here we're going to take a look at the inside of the machine. So we'll obviously take it all apart later but just to get a rough idea of the layout. At the back we can see we have the big power supply. Here's the expansion cards, so we have the display card the hard drive controller, the floppy drive controller, and the serial port card. Here's our floppy drive, and here's our hard drive. So now let's take each of these components out individually and take a look at it, and then we'll get down to the motherboard and be able to actually see what it's like. So the first expansion card we're going to take out is a display adapter, and the printer interface for some reason. So it's all held with a, yet another one of those horrible flathead screws here. These things are an absolute nightmare to get out. I don't know why they use them, it's just so much harder to work with. There we go, so that's that out, and then we can remove this card. Now the card's actually held in at the back here, there's a sort of channel, like plastic channel attached to the front, so it keeps it sort of st like steady, to stop the card flapping about like these ones do. Because obviously they're such long cards, if they were flapping about they would just get damaged, so there is like a little clip there, or a little sort of slight like channel there for it to go into. But yeah, we can now carefully take this card out. It's pretty tricky to get out because it gets stuck on that channel, but if we just sort of carefully lift it out, up and out the slot, right there. Try not to cut my fingers on it. 
because it's not that easy. There we go. And now we just carefully slide it out. Oh. Slightly caught at the back for some reason. There we go. And that is a display adapter out. So let's take a look at it. So here we have that card. So there's a bunch of different chips all over it, all just sort of old school through hole chips being mounted along the main chip in the middle here, which is labeled 6040 MGP. So I think that's some sort of part number for that chip. I looked it up and there's a few different other graphics processors that also use that chip. So that's the main chip there and that is socketed. And down here we can see it's labeled monochrome graphics slash printer card. And here's two ports labeled on the back here, where you can see it's labeled, one's labeled monitor and one, la one is labeled with printer. And yep, and you see there, it's an 8-bit ISA card. This machine only takes 8-bit cards. Yeah, I'll sort of move it slowly past just so if people want part numbers of anything, they can probably get them. And yeah, so that's the display adapter card. The next card we're going to take out is the hard drive controller, which as you can see is absolutely massive in this machine. Um, you know, back this was back from the early days of having hard drives in your PC. The XT was the first sort of IBM PC to include a hard drive, or at least the one from IBM. I imagine some clones did. But yeah, it's definitely very early for hard drive, so that's why it's got the controller just so big. And I can carefully remove this from the machine. There we go. Now we need to be a bit more careful here because there are cables connected onto this. But there should be enough slack if we can get it out. Yep, there we go. Now, on the back here we can see we have the two cables. This machine uses an MFM hard drive, so it has two different cables that go to the hard drive. So you can pull that off there, and that one come off there as well. So now let's take a look at the hard drive controller. So we're now looking at the hard drive controller card. As you can see here, it's made by a company called Zebec. I presume, presume that's how you pronounce it, X-E-B-E-C. And down there is what looks like the part number, which is 62X0786. And yeah, this is the controller card. So this is used for MFM drives using the ST506 interface, which was originally for the Seagate ST506 hard drive. However, many future drives used it and it was sort of adopted by different manufacturers and stuff. And then there you see again it's an 8-bit ISA card. Some dip switches there as well, which I'm not going to dare touch because if I get them wrong I probably won't find a manual to fix it. I'm going to make sure I get them on the video so if I do end up knocking them in the future I can go back and find the video and work out what they were set to. So there we go. And now on here we can see the interface to the drive. So with these drives, with the SD506 drives, you have two cables that go to the hard drive. There's this 34-pin cable and a separate 20-pin cable. The way it works is with these drives, the drive is completely done. There's no logic on the drive really apart from just electronics to move the head and convert our data to this protocol. All the logic about moving heads and what heads to use and all that sort of stuff is done by this controller card. So the 34-pin connector is called the control cable. That sends all the movement commands, head select commands to the drive. So when you request a sector from the controller, the controller works at what sets, steps of movement the hard drive has to do with its stepper motor and sends it down this cable here to control the drive and make it move to the correct position. The 20 pin connector is then just used for carrying data. So the data from the drive then comes down this cable and is sent to the controller. So that's how this works, so you do have to use these two different connectors for the hard drive. So yeah, that's the old card. Again, all, all through whole components. And like before, I'll just move it slowly past, just in case people want to get part numbers off of it. There we go. And actually there, there's like a sort of ROM chip. Copyright ZBEC 1986. So yeah, that is the hardware controller card with all those sort of discrete components sitting in that little cluster there. Yeah, that's it there. Next card to come out is a floppy drive controller, which is a fair bit smaller than the other one, so it should be a bit easier to get out. It's not to deal with these stupid flathead screws, but at least it's not clamped into the other side. There we go. And it's got a single connector on here, I'm just going to unplug before I take it out. So that just pops off. It's a standard 5 and a quarter inch floppy connector, so that really hasn't changed since this. And then we can just lift this card out. And there is our floppy controller, so let's take a look at this. So here's the floppy drive controller. 
not particularly exciting, there's just a few chips on it all through hole. An old NEC chip there, that's probably does most of the work. And then, yeah, nothing really much else, just again, 8 bit ISA slot, big connector on the back, probably for an external floppy drive, and a connector there for the internal floppy drive. Although you can actually run two off that, of course, because you can run two floppy drives off one cable, and a little jumper there. And then just move it past again just to let you see part numbers. So that's the floppy drive controller. The final card to look at here is just that serial port controller. It's nothing that exciting. Just a basic serial port card. And as you can see, it's absolutely tiny in comparison to the others, which is why it's in this top slot here, because it's stuck behind the floppy drive, so you couldn't really fit any longer card in that space. Okay, oh, drop the screw down there. Uh, now you just get that card out, which is just... Pops out like that. And there's our serial port card. So let's take a look at this. So here's a serial port controller. Obviously it's completely tiny, just 8 by ISA slot, and a 25 pin serial connector on the back. There's all the components on it. Nothing really ma that major, it's just like a single big chip that probably provides all the functions. But one really interesting th thing I found is a component sort of thing I've never seen before, which is these. I don't know what these would be called, they're almost like pre-made jumpers, like rather than having a set of jumpers or dip switches that you can change, they're like put in at the factory, because there's another one up here, and if we take it out, that's already loosened it off so hopefully it'll come out fairly easily, yep, and take a look at what this is, it's like, so on the back, on the top there you can just see, all it really is is just, these two aren't connected, these two are connected, but like on the bottom there's actually nothing there, there's no sort of way to configure this, it's literally just like a pre-made jumper. So I wonder if this is like sort of in the factory they have sort of different boxes of these to configure the card separately and if they want to make a card like with this configuration they put this type in which has like disconnected ones at the top and connected ones at the bottom and that's just the one they use and they put that in the card and that configures it and it's not designed to be like user configurable it's just so they can like pick different options in the factory by putting different ones of those in. So I've never seen those before so that's quite quite an interesting component really. Now the next bit I'm going to try and remove is the floppy drive. Um, there's, a, there's already a couple of screws on the bottom of the machine that I've had to take out. Oh god, what's that in there? Um, I think one of them holds the hard drive and one holds the floppy drive. So I've just removed those. And now there should just be this one screw on the side here to come out. And then we should be able to remove the floppy drive assembly. Okay, so we remove that. And then this metal plate just sort of comes off. Like that. And that should have now removed the hard drives. The floppy drive, sorry. So yep, that now slides out the front of the machine. So let's get that out. So this little surround just fell off, that just sort of makes it look nice. And then there's two cables on the back, standard floppy drive cable here. That just comes off there, and there's a Molex connector on the other side here. Which is completely stuck. Okay, so that Molex connector is completely fused into the back of the drive, but it was running off this sort of splitter cable that went to the main Molex from the power supply, so I've just unplugged it from the Molex connector over here. And we can now remove the drive. Now the drive actually removes sort of into the machine, so what you do is you sort of lift it up like that and it comes out that way. And that is our hard drive, or sorry, floppy drive assembly. So let's take a look at this. Okay, so here is our floppy drive assembly. So you can see here it's got the floppy drive on the top and then this just the sort of spacer on the bottom. These two parts are attached by this plate at either side, so there's a plate on either side that screws into each drive. And there's one screw hole here left which goes into the, which is what screws into the actual machine. If you wanted to install a second drive, what you would do is you'd remove these screws here, the two bottom ones, the blanking plate would come out, you'd stick the second drive in and then screw them back. So effectively what you end up doing is using these plates to mount your two drives together and then a single screw to mount it into the system. On the bottom you can see there's the sort of massive drive assembly and there is the big motor or big flywheel for the motor. There's some other bits of it there. On the top you can see there's the actual mechanism on the front which it's fully functioning, as well as the controller card at the back. Then on the back of the drive, you can see we have a sticker here saying it was made in 1986, 31st week. And you can see manufactured for IBM, so it's the original IBM drive. There's a model number there. Don't know who originally made it. See if you can look that model up or something. This is a splitter cable it was connected to. 
So as I mentioned earlier, on the original XT and the original PC, they used full height floppy drives, so you'd only really have one floppy drive. So this meant that the power supply only has a single Molex connector for the floppy drive. Well, it's got two, but one does the hard drive, one does the floppy drive. Whereas in the late model XT, where they've given you a sort of half height drive, you could install two. So they've included this splitter cable with one connector labelled A, and the other one labelled B. So that would be to connect your two drives up, so you'd do that and connect two, hard, two floppy drives in. So that comes pre-supplied. There's a connection that goes off the power supply. And one thing I find quite amusing is I've never seen such a large part number tag on such a simple cable. It's got this whole sort of like, almost like cloth tag. See there's a part number, EC number, date, so 1986, and its vendor is Molex, so it's made by Molex themselves. And then like job number and stuff, so that is like the most ridiculously big tag I've ever seen on a simple cable. But yeah, that's a floppy drive. Next up to be removed we have the hard drives. This is on the side here. Just Two screws here, should take it out. Obviously it had that screw through the bottom as well. Just get these screws out, and then we should be able to slide the drive out the machine. So this drive isn't the original one, obviously. And as you can see by the fact it has a, um, on, the part, on the top it says Wang part number. This drive was originally a computer made by Wang, who made PC clones. However, it's installed in an original IBM sort of cat bay adapter. So obviously this is a half height drive, but the adapter it's in is off of an original IBM drive, designed for when they were mounting the ST225 drives into the XT case, so that's why it has the IBM logo on the front. But yeah, the drive itself isn't from IBM directly. The Molex connector goes on the top there, pops out, and there's our two cables. That's the control cable, and that's the data cable, which are very much like you'd have on a floppy drive. And the whole drive just slides out the front of the machine. There we go, so now let's take a closer look at this. So here we have that ST225 hard drive. As you can see, it's absolutely massive, weighs an absolute ton. There's a the model there, some more information there. The Wang part number, so it's obviously come out of a Wang PC clone. There's the defect map, if people haven't seen that before. Essentially these old drives don't have the capability to find bad sectors and remap them or anything. So in these drives it actually came printed on it, any defects that were found in the factory. It's labelled hard error map. And you had to type these in when you format the drive. Type 25 was the type that was used in the machine essentially. On this side you can see there's a Seagate branding. Made in Singapore. On the other side there's just other barcodes and stuff. On the front we can see that's what we saw from the outside. So there's the IBM logo because the caddy itself that it's mounted on is IBM branded. And there's the original LED. So it effectively makes it a full height drive. You see on the underside there there's actually a little cable that connects the LED and that cable goes up and connects to the PCB of the hard drive and can be disconnected. On the back we can see there's the two connectors, there's the data one, there's the control one. Wallet's well, connector, and on the bottom there's just a few components. Nothing that major on these drives, obviously, because all the logic is really done by that controller. But yeah, that is our massive old hard drive. As a sort of size comparison, that's a three and a half inch hard drive. So, yeah, it's quite large compared to that. It's a bit even in terms of thickness. Then, for more comparisons, that's two and a half inch hard drive. That's a flash drive. There's a SD card, 64 gigs compared to 20 meg. And there's a micro SD card. So that's like the sort of evolution of technology really. 20 meg, I mean that's two gig, but these go up to like hundreds of gigs now for a micro SD card, so yeah. Quite a size difference. And here's all the wiring that's been removed from the machine. These are the cables that went onto the hard drive and then go off to these connectors there that go to the controller. Unfortunately the tape on it sort of degraded over time and they're horribly sticky so I don't really want to touch them too much. But that's the hard drive cables. And then here is a floppy drive cable which, that end goes to the controller. There's drive A, there's drive B. So if you had two drives again you could just plug that straight into them. Now that the hard drive is removed we can see the manufacturing date of this machine which is 26th of November 1986. So it's definitely quite late in the XT's life that this one was made. Now let's take a look at this power supply and see what it's like. I mean, I suppose I don't really need to take it out, but may as well. I've, I've taken apart this, this machine apart this far, so I may as well just keep, keep going and do the rest of the thing. So it's held with four screws on the back of the machine, and then she just lifts straight out. So now all we need to do is unplug the two cables from the motherboard here, and the drive should just slide out if you slide it backwards a little bit to disengage, and then it should just lift off. And that is our power supply. It's also interesting that it hasn't actually been painted under where the power supply goes. So now here's the power supply. 
So in the back, we can see there's the two connectors we've seen before, as well as the fan, or the, or the air vent. On the top of the power supply, we can actually see there's the actual fan itself. As well as down here, we can see there's the part number, 220 volts, and it's 4.2 amps of 12 volt, 0.25 amps negative 12, 15 amps of 5 volt, I mean the machine runs almost entirely on 5 volt, and 0.3 amps of negative 5 volt. See there's made in Ireland, and it's rated as 130 watt. On this side, we can just see the cables all come out here, and then there's sort of individual ratings for each each sort of connector on all the pins, so you can actually see what how you're loading it all. Here's the cables itself, so you have this Molex that goes off the hard drive, so it's quite long. This one here, which would do the floppy drive, and these two P8 and P9 that go to the motherboard, which are sort of standard AT connectors, although I think they're wired slightly differently. Nothing on the back at all. And on this side, again, we have the awesome power switch and some test stickers, so the various tests it's been done and probably who it's been done by or whatever all stamped on. And now if we've gone this far, we may as well just take the motherboard out. So first thing we need to do is remove the PC speaker. It's held with like little plastic clips, so you squeeze them in and it just pops out and then connects the motherboard with the cable, it comes off. And that's our PC speaker, just a little speaker there, on the mounted little bracket that clicks into the front of the machine and then connects the motherboord with a little header. And now what we need to do is remove the motherboard. So the motherboard is actually only held in with a single screw here. Everything else is just like little plastic clips. So I'll just basically take that screw out, squeeze the little plastic clips, and the board should just lift out the machine. Actually, wait, correction, there's another screw here as well I need to take out. But then we should be able to remove the board. So, I'm trying to get the screw out. I think I've actually undone all the clips already, so it's quite convenient finding that screw and filming it. So, take that final screw out. And now, hopefully, we'll be able to get the board out. I have obviously had the board out of this before, because I had to fix that capacitor problem, but yeah, that's there, so hopefully if we're careful, we should be able to just lift the board. Yep, yeah, there we go, it's coming out. And that's the motherboard. So now let's take a look at this. So before we take a look at the board, I'm just going to show something that shows how bad condition this machine it was in when I got it. So this is where the motherboard is mounted. Here's little mounts, they sort of just slot into little slots there, and it's like a little peg that goes in at the bottom, and sticks out the top and that pokes through the board and you can just sort of squeeze the sides to release the board and then you just slot into these little slots here. However, if you look over here, you'll see something a bit interesting. So it lifts it up closer and look at that. Oh, all these little mounts falling out. Yes, that is literally marks from the legs on some of the chips. Because when I got this machine, it was dented in massively at the bottom. I'm pretty sure that was from when it was like before it wasn't damaged in shipping, it was actually like, like that. You can see on the bottom here, the machine's actually very slightly bowed out. When I got it, that was opposite, that was dented inwards. And it was actually like bashing off the, like pushing into the motherboard, which was causing that damage to the paint. So when I got this, the motherboard was actually like sort of being pressed by the bottom of the case. And it poked through the paint. So I mean, imagine that was probably shorting out that chip and all the other chips around it. So yeah, that does just sort of sum up the condition this machine was in. And it's amazing it survived all that. So effectively what I had to do when I took the board out to fix the capacitor problem, I also like basically took a hammer and just sort of dented this back out, so it's not completely flat, it does now bow outwards a little bit, but at least that's completely away from the motherboard. I might also like put something like insulating tape or something over this, just so if it did get dented in again, those bits of exposed metal won't touch the pins on the chip and short it out, because that's quite bad. But yeah, amazingly the machine survived. So now here we are looking at the motherboard of the XT. So what we'll do is we'll take a look around it and then just see how it's all laid out. So down here you can see like the part number. And then it says 256 to 640 kilobyte system board. So the minimum, or like the original amount RAM this shipped with was 256 kilobyte, but this board could be upgraded to 640 kilobyte. Whereas the previous boards, you couldn't have 640 kilobytes on board, you needed a separate expansion card to handle that. And over here we can see it says no copying permitted and all rights reserved. Which is quite amusing because, yeah, people just copied these for all the clones, didn't they? It wasn't really, the no, co no copying permitted thing didn't really work. And yep, there's the 8 ISA slots we have here. And then if you look down here, we can see the, all, all the RAM. So, here's the RAM on this machine. We can see we have four banks labeled down the side. And then across the top, there's across in rows, there's set, there's sorry nine stick nine chips. Up the top here, you can see the leftmost one's labeled parity, bit zero. That's not labeled, but it'll be bit one, bit two, bit three, bit four, bit five, bit six, and bit seven. So it must be doing some sort of interleaving, so like each word is stored across multiple chips with each bit in each chip, along with having a parity bit for some sort of memory protection. That's quite neat. 
I am wondering if, if this RAM has been upgraded later or they just use different types of RAM for each bank because these chips are made for, clearly made by a different manufacturer to these ones. These are NEC and these ones are made by a company I don't quite recognise. So yeah, I'll hold it like that and see if we can get the part numbers and um, see if we can look that up afterwards. So yeah, that's how the RAM's all laid out. Also, you, you could use beyond 640 kilobytes of RAM in this machine, but you'd have to get an ISA card then use extended memory drivers to actually make that work. And then there's that connection for this PC speaker we disconnected earlier. Now if we look up in the top left corner of the board, we can see where it gets a bit more exciting. So there's the power connection from the power supply, there's that keyboard port, but here is the processor, the Intel 8088. You can probably almost make it out there, it says P8088. Copyright Intel, it's 1978 and 1983. So that is the main processor of this machine, which you know doesn't really look like it because it's just a simple chip in a socket, but yep, that is the Intel 8088. Up there is an empty socket, that would hold the Intel 8087, I'm pretty sure the number would have been, math core processor. So if you wanted a floating point unit, you could add one in there. There's also different versions of XTs with different types of core processors that sort of allowed it to run code for different IBM systems that weren't x86 based. But yeah, that that's, would usually be used for a core processor for a floating point unit stuff. Over here we see some dip switches. These were used to configure this system. Unlike on more modern machines where you'd actually have a BIOS and you'd either set it up, well it has a BIOS, but where you'd have a BIOS with a configuration utility that you'd either load off of ROM or like the Compact Portable 2 where you'd put a boot floppy in to set the machine up. This machine doesn't have any of that. All settings are set via these dip switches. So in some ways that's good because there's no battery on this machine. It doesn't have a real-time clock pre-installed, you'd have to get a separate card for that. So it means that you know it's not going to forget its settings like more modern machines would when the batteries fail. But yeah, that is how you set this. So this sets everything from what devices to boot from, what sort of graphics adapters installed and all that sort of stuff. So that's the zip switches and that's what it's set to there. And there's a couple of bodge wires put in. I don't know if they are just by design or if they're actually just because of manufacturing defects with the board that they've had to put them in. But yeah, that's them. Now over here, we can see we have two ROM chips. One of these holds IBM BASIC and one of these holds the actual BIOS. So you've got the BIOS there, you know, to do all the BIOS stuff, boot off the disk and all that thing, all those things. And then IBM BASIC is there as a sort of onboard BASIC interpreter. As far as I'm aware, it was never really used. Like it wasn't the sort of thing you'd buy a PC to use IBM BASIC. But if you get one of these and it boots to BASIC, it quite often means like the hard drive's failed or whatever. Or you've not got a hard drive and you've not put a floppy in. So it's got some basic on board which you can use if you really wanted to. And yeah, there's just a few more chips. One thing I find quite amusing here actually is there's these two chips here um, which look virtually identical and they've both got an eye on them which makes me think, you know, Intel, I, th I think that's generally I think Intel put on their chips. But if you look at the copyrights, the top one is copyright Intel 1981, the bottom is copyright AMD. I mean I know AMD used to make some chips based on Intel's designs and stuff so but it's still quite interesting. I, th I didn't know that, I thought that I would have meant it was Intel so don't that some sort of licensing thing that AMD have licensed the Intel logo or something? A bit strange. There's another Intel chip there. So yeah, that is the motherboard for the XT. It's surprisingly quite a small board. It's not huge. I, mean, I suppose it's probably similar to the AT form factor, really. Um, but yeah, that is the motherboard. And then finally, just in case anyone was wondering, that's what the underside of the board looks like. Basically no components there, just a lot of uh, solder joints. And there's some sort of part number or whatever there. And that looks like a manufacturing date. Their seventh week, 1986. So yeah, that's motherboard. Oh, and there's also some um, test stickers on the side there with various signatures written on it, as uh, you know, for all the different pa tests it's passed. You don't see that on the modern board. Now, finally, if we look above the ISA slots on this motherboard, you can see C56, and you can see there's sort of empty holes here. That is where the capacitor that failed was. So when they got the machine that was failing with that capacitor that was short-circuited and it was cutting the power supply out, this was the capacitor that had the problem, C56. And you see it was, it was like one of, the, one of those there, just a little tantalum capacitor in the motherboard, but it had gone dead short and it was just shorting that negative 12 volt rail out. So yeah, I just basically completely removed it. I also cleaned the holes out so they're completely empty, so if I did have problems with the machine like stability issues or whatever, I could buy an appropriate capacitor and install it. It's definitely possible to fit it and it wouldn't be too expensive. But I just decided that after removing it, the machine worked absolutely fine. And it probably was just doing some sort of filtering thing. And I'd rather not risk breaking it by, by adding one in if it works currently. So, yep, that is where that capacitor was. So now let's get this thing reassembled and check it all still works. 
So there you have it. That was a look at my IBM PC XT from 1986. It's definitely a very interesting machine to take apart. It's just so old school inside. And as you can see, it works perfectly. So yeah, thank you very much for watching.